Good evening, everybody. Erev Tov. Uh, this is uh, the, actually the 23rd, now the 23rd day of Vadar, Tavshin Pei Gimel, uh, 5783. Um, this is uh, the Wednesday evening Kins class that is actually, this is, uh, is recorded live. So those of you who are listening now, listening live, as opposed to what we had thought would be. Um, also, uh, this week, of course, is Shabbat HaChodesh. Very important. It's a double Parsha, Vayakel today, And uh, so we're ready now to begin. Last week, again, this is recorded in uh, the year 2023, 5783. Uh, those of you who were with us last week, um, we read a or we learned a medrash in which Moshe Rabbeinu, Kiva Yachol, as if it's even possible, um, sort of instructs HaKadosh Baruch Hu, telling him that he should not be upset about the golden calf, because after all, uh, you Hashem are the one who picked Mitzrayim. They grew up there for well over 200 years. And so when they are frightened and they feel alone, they resort to the only tool they know, and in this case, it would be to create an avodazara uh, that they had hoped would would um, would save them from uh, sure death in the uh, in the in the desert if Moshe Rabbeinu did not return. Uh, and the Medrash so beautifully points out that it's a marshal of uh, a father who sets his son up in business. He, he first has him trained as a perfumer, and then he sets him up, uh, actually finds a location for it, for his shop, which of course uh, is in the, uh, turns out, is in the uh, uh, street of, of prostitution and har harlotry. So the Medrash says, the Medrash Rabba says, well, over the course of time, the, um, the location did its job and the profession did its job, and the young boy, being faced with temptations, did what a young boy does. And the father becomes infuriated. Again, this is last week's, but you're going to see how we're going to connect this together. The boy, the, the, boy, uh, the father becomes infuriated, and, he's, and he utters the term, I'm going to kill you. But of course, along with the father, there is a, there is a friend. And the friend said, what do you want from him? Of all the locations in the world, of all the professions that you could have chosen for him, you, you chose perfumery. And of all the locations you, you chose to, for a perfumer, you chose uh, a, a street of harlots. What do you expect? Then the Medrash says, Kach Amar Moshe uh, uh, Don't, why are you angry? With your people, I share Eretz Mitzrayim. You look at where you took them out of. What else do you expect? So that medrash, uh, in in its own way, is uh, so to speak, uh, metaphorically, Moshe castigates Hakadosh Baruch, Hu. and uh, and he says, "You're the one who caused this problem. So why are you so angry?" This week, we're going to see another medrash. And this time, we will see that the tables are turned. So actually, the, the, the two, uh, the two uh, weeks in a row and the two midrashim are themselves, even though they're from different midrashim, different books, nevertheless, they're instructive of us. Now, I think also I try to point out uh, always the, the psukim, Maybe maybe talking about Moshe and Aaron, or maybe talking about maybe talking about uh, Cain and Hevel, but it's really talking about us. It tells us, it instructs us, it teaches us about us. It's not just a history lesson, and we'll find as well these midrashim teach us not accurately about what we can tell Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Whatever Moshe thought of, as brilliant as he was. God himself, of course, thought of as well. But it is to teach us about our failings and sometimes to teach us about our strengths and what we can. So that's what we're going to talk about this, this week. Uh, 
the uh, I want to just mention though about the Mishkan before we get into the Medrash itself. Uh, you know, of course, the the uh, the, the psukim themselves uh, talk about the building of the Mishkan, and Betzalel is uh, the the architect of it. He, he God gives him the blueprint, and Betzalel does the work. He and his uh, and and his uh, staff, they they do the work. Now there there are various different views as to whether and how Betzalel. Uh, actually attained this remarkable ability to do what uh, he was able to do. But the, the Pasuk tells us in, in, in uh, Parsha Pekudei, the last Parsha in Shmot, um, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu oversaw the work of the Mishkan and, and the various different uh, elements, all of them, whether it was Baron Kodesh or the Shulchan or the, or the uh, the, the Chatser or the Mizbachot, all of that Moshe Rabbeinu oversaw, plus the Big Day Kuhuna. And in Perak Lamed Tet, Hasuk Mem Gimel, the Pasuk says, Vayar Moshe et kol hamalacha. Moshe Rabbeinu observed all of the artisanship, the work that uh, had been done. Behine Asu Ota, they had done it. Bitzalel and, uh, and his helpers uh, performed it. Tashir Tziva Hashem Kenasu. As Hashem commanded, that's exactly what they did. Vayavarech Tam Moshe. And Moshe Rabbeinu blessed them with the bracha um, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that just as their hands worked as uh, faithfully, so may indeed, um, so may it be, and so may the Mishkan itself um, uh, make, bring to fruition all of their work. Now, brings the question as to what is, where does art or artistry, the artist, where does that fit in, in, uh, in Judaism? How is that so? Um, for example, in Western society, the artist reigns supreme. One may not at all modify what the artist has done, and the artist is given a free hand to express himself or herself however they would like. Of course, unfortunately, we all know that when we, we've seen art, that uh, it certainly does not conform to the Jewish attitudes of decency. Now, sometimes, of course, it does. Uh, Monet, very often, or, or other beautiful, magnificent uh, uh, portrait artists, it certainly can conform, but oftentimes it doesn't. And we, it moves from beautiful to vulgar, all in the name of art. And Rav Hirsch talks about this, the artist, and he says as follows, this free joyful obedience, this freedom in obedience and obedience in freedom, which fills one with a happy consciousness of one's own, uh, one's own powers. Uh, this is what Rav Hirsch calls the true Jewish artist. And again, I'm going to I'm going to stress this here: freedom in obedience, and obedience in freedom. But Salah was given a task to do, and he did it. But he was a, he was a great artist. No question that the average person could not have done. What Pizzallo, what Pizzallo could do, he and the people um, whom he chose to join him. But notice the two elements are there: freedom, the freedom to uh, for him to express himself in a magnificent way, but it was within obedience that he had self-imposed and external guidelines, which uh, which uh, to which he conformed and which, uh, which guided him to do the things that he did. So you say, well, a shulchan is a shulchan. No, a shulchan is not a shulchan. Hashem gave him the general blueprint, but it had the mark. The shulchan had the mark of, of Betzalel. The, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the menorah had the mark of Betzalel on it. 
uh, very much like if anybody has ever seen the beauty of a Sefer Torah. Sefer Torah, you can tell. If you know, if you know the scribe and you know the Sefer, you know which one he, uh, was the Sefer Torah that he wrote. But wait a minute, all the letters have, have strict, um, strict guidelines about how they're to be made. That is true. But within those guidelines, within that obedience, the artist was given the freedom to be able to function that would, in a way that made his Sefer Torah distinct from others. And so, so it is with Sefer Torah, and so it is with the, the artistry that went into the, to the, to the Mishkan, to the Big Dekauna, to every aspect of the, uh, of, of the uh, creation of the, of the furniture and the furnishings and the, and the clothing in the Mishkan. So this is something which I think we should bear in mind that it in fact is very important. Now, let us take a look and see what Chazal tell us um, on, the, uh, on the Mishkan itself. We're gonna talk about today, we're gonna focus only on the Kior, the wash basin, a Kior v'kano, and that we know that um, the Torah tells us, again, specifically, that Hashem gave guidelines to Tzalel, and he was to create this. And the Torah tells us, Bayas ba'et adnei petach oel moed, that, uh, that uh, the nechoshet was used to cre create the knobs of the openings of the oel moed, uh, of the opening of the oel moed, that Mizbach Hanachoshe and the the uh, the uh, bre the copper Mizbeach, the Et Mizbar Hanachoshe Tasherlo, all of it, Hanachoshe which was used, and then we see that the mirror itself, at Et Mizbach Hanachoshe, Et Mizbar Hanachoshe, all of that, Et Akiyor Et Kano, all of that was made from the Choshe, from the copper. Now. Uh, the question is, of course, we're not going to go into which um, which furnishings were specifically of gold and which were specifically of silver, but today we're going to talk about the kior. Now, um, the, uh, the the kior itself is described in the pasuk in Parak Lamed Chet Pasuk Chet by Yas et Kior Nechosh and. Um, and Betzalel made or directed the making of the kior nechoshe, copper, the et kano nechoshe, and um, the the base of the of, of the kior, the wash basin, also nechoshe. Bimarot hatsov. Here is the what we're going to focus on tonight. The marot hatsovot of the 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 many mirrors. Mar'a mar is a mirror. Hatsovot, uh, of course, the word, the, tza, the shorish, tzadi, bet, aleph, uh, in itself is indicative of, of multitudes of things, whatever the things are. By Hulu Hashemayim Va'aretz, Chol Siva'am. All of the, the, you know, everything from the meteors to the comets to the planets to the, to the galaxies, all of that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created. Right, and and that would be called Siva Hashemai, the um, the multitudes of the heavens. So these are Marot Hatsovot, the mirrors that were uh, the, of the multitudes. Asher Tzavu Petach Olmoi Hatsovot. In this case, are it seems to be not only Marot the the, um, the mirrors, but the people who brought them. Asher Tzavu. Petach Oel Moe, that they uh, that they were were compiled and brought uh, into the opening of the Oel Moe, and this is a very unusual pasuk, and uh, it has um, uh, caused many um, a fortune to talk about it. But we're going to focus really only on uh, the Medrash. Uh, in this case, it would be the Tanchuma, one of Rashi's favorite. Um, um, midrashim, midrashe agada, and as we've mentioned many times, the um, there are two types of midrashim. 
One is, uh, is a homiletical midrash, meaning to say uh, it is not intended to be a halachic midrash, but rather to help us to understand the Torah and to understand ourselves. That's what Agadic midrashim do. Rashi draws on this. There's, of course, the halachic midrashim, and those halachic midrashim literally are the basis for the formulation and the understanding of the mitzvot that, that Hashem has given us. But now Rashi takes from the Tanchuma in Pekude, Tet. And what he does is very often the case, he edits it to some degree. Uh, sometimes the Midrash is very long and it's certainly worthwhile going through each and every piece. But uh, Rashi, of course, in his commentary, tried to be as sparse as possible in his wording. Let's see what Rashi says to us about Hamarot Hatsovot, the, the mirrors. Now, are these, the word Hatsovot, is it uh, the, the multitude of mirrors or is it the mirrors of the multitude? Is it the multitude of mirrors, Hamarot Hatsovot, or is it the, uh, the uh, mirrors of the multitude, meaning to say so many people brought them. That's what we're going to focus on. Here's what the Medr said. But no Yisrael, hayu adam marot, the women of the Jewish people, like, like, uh, like men, women throughout history, women, women all over, they had marot, they had mirrors. So as they would look in a mirror, they'd get, they'd get dressed. They wanted to, they want to look their best. And they, they would look at mirrors, perhaps more than men do. Again, the issue here, please, of course, all, sometimes we get so wrapped up on, on racism and, and sexism and things of that nature. We don't have to. But, but certainly... Uh, uh, for many people, a mirror is an indispensable part of their of their house to some degree. A mirror, not everybody, everybody, but uh, mirrors and women use them because, indeed, part of their part of their uh, relationship with their husbands and with others has to do with how they look. Nothing wrong with that. So, so they would look in the mirrors. Now, what did these women do? They looked at the mirrors so that they would be attractive, and then they gave it to the Mishka. And Rashi says, and actually in paraphrasing the Rish, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was repulsed by this. You're going to give mirrors to the temple? You're going to give mirrors to the Beit HaMikdash? Mirrors are trivial, and they certainly have no place in the Mishkan. Says Rashi, they feed uh, on the Yetzir Hara. That each of us, of course, has our own vanity, our, our, and, uh, our own uh, elements that, that become what we would call a Yetzir Hara, that, uh, that uh, disrupts ourselves and causes us to be distracted from what is really important in life. Moshe Rabbeinu did not want it. He rejected them. The women contributed. Omar lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Oh, now we're seeing a turnaround from last week's Medrash. Last week's Medrash, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Hashem, how can you be upset and angry with them because, uh, because they turned to a, a Voda Zara when they, were, when they were terrified of being alone in the desert? Uh, so that was the Medrash there. And you, it was your fault, says Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, again, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu did not say anything that God had not thought of. But now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe, who is repulsed by the mirrors, okay? Kabeo, Moshe, accept these mirrors. The Elu Chavivin Alai Meako. This is the most beloved feature of the Mishkan that was silver, gold, precious metals, precious. Precious fabrics, all of that's wonderful. That's very good. The most precious of all, says 
uh, Akkadish Baruch Hu, uh, so it says the, the Medrash, in, in, in the words of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this is the most precious of all. She'al yedehem ha'amidu ha'nashim sevaot rabot in Israel. Through these mirrors, the Jewish people survived. Also, when their husbands would come home from uh, an absolutely uh, depressing day, Depressing isn't even the, the, the word for it. They came home absolutely uh, unable to have the energy to do anything at all. And probably we're not only talking about the physical energy, we're talking about the emotional energy. What, what must they think about themselves? What is my value? I'm meaningless. I take one brick and put it on another brick, which is put on another brick. That's my whole life. And they begin to believe that their lives are worth, that they are worth, not their wives, but their lives. What would these wives do? They would give them uh, food that, and, and, uh, Things that they that they would like, and they would they would then feed their husbands, and they would take the mirrors that they had. This is long before the Mishkan was built. And you could see that they would they would look at each other almost like in, as in a selfie. That's what we call it now. She'd look in the mirror, and he'd look in the same mirror. Imbala the mara. They would then they would tease their husbands lovingly, tease them and and, uh, and 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 in a way flirt with them. Lomar, Anina Amimcha, I am certainly better looking than you are. Mitoch kach, neviot levalehem ta'ava, that they would arouse their husbands to a sense of love, an expression. Now, I'd like to say that one of the questions that I, that I had asked is, okay, it's teasing, so we're not going to be upset, but how would that, how would that make, the, make the husband, uh, uh, shall we say, put him in a romantic mood? I think when they looked at the, at the mirror together, he saw himself as, as literally ugly, repulsive, came home, must have been covered with dirt and, and, and downtrodden. And he looked at his wife and he saw that she was beautiful. And this beautiful person thinks that he's beautiful. That's the case, of course, when people whom, whom we admire and whom we love think that we're beautiful inwardly, outwardly, but inwardly particularly. So then that in itself encouraged the husband to be intimate with their wives. And they were deeply appreciative of everything that their wives did for them. But it all came about from the mirror because she wanted him to see himself and to see her. And that she, even though she was kiddingly saying to him, I'm more beautiful than you, he understood. He saw in her true beauty and that, that aroused them to to become intimately and from that intimate and from that uh, from that they they had their children and it says hat it doesn't mean the multitude of mirrors it means the mirrors of the multitude the multitudes that were created through the mirrors as as a tool to express their love to each other. So then, now Muhammad Leibitz says to us, Here, see, when we talked, we said the multitude of the mirrors, um, that, of course, is true. You can read it that way. But Nechama says, really, um, it means the mirrors that created the multitude. And so therefore, that's, it's what we would call a transitive verb. 
that the mirrors were the, were the agent by which uh, the women created the multitudes. It was the vehicle through which the Jewish people survived through all of that, all of that, those difficult times. Hamamidot tzivot Yisrael. It is the mirrors that allowed the women to be able to conceive and then to, uh, to, to literally give birth to the armies of the Jewish people. That very inclination which was made to bring a person to avot, to avot, to depravity. In, it. in other words, miracle, uh, mirrors could be used for depravity or for trivialness, triviality, right? And to tumah. And in the hands of people, unfortunately, it can't be that way. Who, who? It is that very mirror, said Nechem, she'alul lahavi li'tzira. That very mirror, that very mirror brought about creation, the binyan bayin, the building of household. Okay? For the continuity of the Jewish people. On this type of a, because of this type of a, um, of a vehicle, Neamar Eitzel Chachamenu, the Chachamim said, Vahavta Lerecha Kamocha, on the Pasik in the Barim, shall love the Lord your God, Bechol Levavcha, with all of your heart. And what do they say there in, in Brachot? Mishnei Yitzrech, both inclination, the Yitzer Tov, the Yitzer Ra, in the of course, with the good inclination and with what, what is often the bad inclination. So here we have an important principle that is set forth. Almost everything in this world can be used for good or can be used for evil. It could be used, the, the, uh, the mirrors, generally speaking, often, they're just for triviality. They're for vanity. And it certainly does not create the mirrors themselves uh, in, in, a, in a day to day sense. Did not much. Did not do much to create um, people who are uh, driven to do good. But the medrash is saying, you you need to know. We need to know that in fact that very mirror, which was a vehicle for trivial behavior, Jewish women turned into a vehicle, an instrument to create the Jewish people, to tell their husbands, we are going to go on. We will prevail. And they did it through flirting. They did it through teasing. They did it through the mirror. And so therefore, that's a lesson for all of us. And that is that everything on this world has within it the capacity to be able to do good, to bring about good. So let us remember the lesson of Hamarot Hatsovot, of the mirrors that created the, the tzava. Now, by, by the way, that's how we get the Hebrew word for army. Tzava means a multitude of people all functioning for the same purpose. So these marot hatsovot, these mirrors, which in fact created the legions of the Jewish people, would ultimately go out of Mitzrayim. So I want to wish everybody Shabbat Shalom. Uh, the Shabbat is Shabbat Chodesh. It's also Shabbat Mavarchim. So it's a very blessed Shabbos. As we bless the new month, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu bless us as we embark upon these three weeks just before Pesach, a holiday of our freedom. Freedom within obedience and obedience within freedom. Shabbat shalom until Dabra Bob. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Good Shabbos, thank you. Good Shabbos, Micah. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Shabbat shalom until Dabra Bob. Bakasha, my pleasure.